could not have uh, predicted the path my career has taken. I first studied philosophy at the Pennsylvania State University uh, in the town where I grew up. I got into philosophy because I was intrigued by structures and history. At first, I'd wanted to study architecture, but then realized that I was more interested in other sorts of edifices, namely the way various ideas, values, and practices hang together in our lives. I also realized that I was interested in the philosophical ideas I'd encountered in high school history courses, in particular courses that raised for me the question of history's meaning. While I first wondered about the possibility of progress in social and political life, I also became interested in the ways that the arts and sciences related to their histories. Above all, I was captivated by experiences of profound change. Wanting to discover the world outside rural Pennsylvania, I moved to Chicago. Through a certain persistence, I found my way into graduate studies at DePaul University, where I was able to pursue and elaborate my philosophical interests. After my PhD, I had a stint lecturing at Seattle University. Then for my first long-term post as researcher and teacher, I moved out of philosophy and into a humanities department at University of the Sciences in Philadelphia. And now that school, which grew out of the first college of pharmacy in the US is merging into a Jesuit university, St. Joseph's. As a result, I'll soon find myself uh, once again in a philosophy department. So the word career comes from a Latin word denoting a wheeled vehicle. Wheels imply smooth surfaces, smooth enough to roll over and traverse in this manner. Wheels imply passable roads and terrain. Retrospectively, my career so far might seem to have followed a smooth enough path. But events can both surprise us and remind us that our lives and the paths they take are not laid out in advance. I would say that my work on Kangiem and Error responds to and resonates with that reality. Yeah, my, so my undergraduate studies were in the history of philosophy, especially modern French and German philosophy. I also enjoyed courses in anthropology and art history. I followed all these interests into graduate school where I became particularly fascinated with 18th century ideas about the beautiful and the sublime and the ways these were taken to express moral character. This led to a master's thesis on Johann Joachim Winkelmann's history of art. It also encouraged my examination of contemporary European attempts to explain human differences through the concept of race. I found an ideal candidate for such a study in Immanuel Kant, since he devoted serious effort to elaborating such a concept of race and deploying it for the sake of a pragmatic anthropology. Even more, in his critical project, he used the same natural historical terminology by which he conceptualized race to describe the human mind, its parts, and rationality. In short, Kant worried that, we'd su that we suffered from pathological tendency insofar as our practical reason is affected and motivated by sources external to itself. Race for him was one such factor. Broadly speaking though, he treated all external affections and motivations as symptoms of a disease in which our reason is infected with moral error. So I looked first to Michel Foucault for methods by which to elaborate this critical interpretation of Kant's work. But through a class on Foucault, I encountered Canguillem's book, The Normal and the Pathological, and I soon began to think that Canguillem would provide tools helpful for both interpreting Kant's philosophy and for understanding what Foucault himself had been, had been doing, what he was up to. I came to the, the, the Canguillem collection because I wanted to read his courses on error. I thought that my thesis on Kant might also present some of his ideas about error and use them as a method by which to critically interrogate Kant's ideas about moral and physical forms of error. Once I figured out, once I figured out how to read Kangiem's handwriting, the, the courses did not disappoint. Uh, they solidified my understanding of him as a philosopher whose abiding concern was the unavoidable and creative problem that error poses for us. And they helped me argue that Kant's diagnosis of human errors provided one way into later attempts to distinguish normal from abnormal people. One day, I think I might have to revisit that argument, but I've not yet pursued it beyond my doctoral thesis because these courses on error inspired me to read and interpret Kangiem's major publications 
in terms of the problem of error. I've spent over a decade now carefully interpreting his publications as attempts to pose or address this problem. While it may seem surprising, and I've not convinced everyone, I have become convinced that the vast majority of his writings can be interpreted as raising particular versions of the problem of error and providing particular attempts to defuse its dangers while also fostering what it makes possible. Art, medicine above all, but also literature and visual art, technology, science, politics, ethics, history, life, Kangiyam considered all these domains of experience by asking after the meaning and place of error within them. So the collection uh, at Cafes also held many interesting surprises for me. Uh, a postcard of a painting that I found in one of his course dossiers, for example, eventually provided the image for the cover of my book on him. The books from his personal library were also unexpected and fascinating. Many of the volumes contain intriguing dedications to him from a wide variety of contemporary authors inside and outside of philosophy. Kangiyam said somewhere that his published writings are the traces of his work. And I believe he thought that he pursued his work in the classroom and in collaborative research with others. Seeing the dedications in his books, books that people gave him, uh, <clears throat> these have encouraged me to read him through his convergences, divergences, and collaborations with contemporaries, with his readers, his collaborators, and his students. Yeah, I would like to read a bit from a long forgotten text that's now available again, thanks to the publication of his complete works. It's from a short essay entitled Experience and Adventure, published first in the journal of a French high school in Lisbon, the same year that he replaced Bachelard at the Sorbonne. In it, Kangiyam argues for a simultaneous need for experience and silence about this experience. For me, it offers a succinct statement of some key ideas concerning error. Here it is. Experience comes from a Greek word that signifies attempt, ordeal, adventure. Experience is the attempt whose outcome is presumed without being foreseen. It is an essay that risks failure. In this way, error, which is going astray as much as mistake, accompanies experience as its shadow. For the human being, lacking instinct, only reasoning and habit can provide security. But reasoning and habit can only play their role afterwards, when the surprise of events has been channeled and disciplined into the impression of something banal. The human being can only exploit what they themselves have discovered and can only discover in danger. The human being is constrained to experience, to adventure. But life is short. It is maturation, that is to say, from the first moment, aging. From this comes the need to substitute experience as lesson for experience as attempt, with an eye to reducing the attempts, avoiding peril, gaining time, dominating the event instead of facing it. Experience would then be a, a wisdom that would free us from adventure, a knowledge that would do without the ordeal. Yet the idea of an experience before experience is an illusion. Even if situations repeated themselves, we would not be spared weariness. Even if things did not change, it is we who would have changed. One would have to be original to make use in a cliched world of what we can only owe to custom, thus to wear and tear. The human being can, therefore, only keep their silence about what they dare and what they do. He alone speaks who no longer does, and it is he who is called a man of experience. But this experience lesson is empty of efficacy. It no longer has any for the story's author, it will never have any for the audience. Finally, even without needing to invoke some artificial will to dissimulation, authentic experience is incommunicable. No one can skip going to see what others have seen if one wants to gain from what they have seen. No one can be deprived, even with the best intentions, of their share of adventure. Mm -hmm.